So, games and the emotion in games largely comes from the choices that we make. Too long, didn't read. Really. So, we go through a rapid set of automatic um, evaluations as things happen to us about what each event might mean for our goals and plans. This is everyday life. You know, when in everyday life, and uh, <laughs> it's one of my favorite lines from the television program, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> when Dennis turns around and says, yeah, yeah, I'm starting to feel emotions again. <laughs> Mark goes, you don't feel emotions. <laughs> um, he says, no, not really, but now I'm starting to get, you know, it's, it feels good. Um, Every day, we go through a tumult of emotions, and they largely, these emotions are provoked <coughs> by our evaluations of things as they happen to us. Um, and this is no different in a video game environment as well. Our characters, uh, are, we are embodying in a particular way, things happen, we react to those things that happen. And emotions arise in the context of the appraisals that we have to those events. So the emotional tenor of what we experience comes from how we appraise these things. Now, a lot of psychological research has gone into this and uses video games actually as the way of understanding this mechanism. So psychologists for a long time have been looking to try and understand the cognitive mechanisms of emotional response and actually use video games in laboratory settings to try and understand how emotional response actually works in this way. So, there is a long history of research on this, so um, using this research from 2012, experiment which some participants played a game and others watched a live video stream of another person playing. Uh, these uh, psychologists used MRI scanning in order to track um, emotional pathways in the brain. Um, active gamers showed far greater emotional response basically along those uh, brain pathways than people who were just sitting back in emotion. So this research has been pivotal in understanding the difference between games and other media texts in terms of emotional response. The people who were sitting and watching, yeah, yeah, okay, there is an emotional connection to what's going on, but it was far more intense. And really, what this kind of research, if you ever see research like this that uses this kind of invasive scanning technique, what they're looking at is physiological arousal. The game provides more emotional arousal to us. Games are emotionally more connective in that way. Um, playing a game is more actually like running a race than watching a film about somebody running a race in that context. So it's the activity allied to this notion of choice, allied to this um, notion of um, being connected to the uh, way the game flows and way it actually develops, then uh, uniquely I had to use the word flow. So before study break, I kind of went to town on flow a little bit. Um, but I do want to emphasize that flow is a really, really important concept uh, in terms of emotionality of games. If we are in, um, she sent me Hiley's, you know, classic so sweet spot for flow, we are much more likely to have an emotional reaction to what is going on. So, well-designed games with the control they offer readily engage players in a flow state, and when that well-designed game is allowing us a level of control where we feel like our actions have meaningful consequences, then we are more likely to be emotionally engaged as well. So, whereas I think Flow is slightly problematic in some ways in terms of how it in, we engage emotionally with games. It's a very, very important idea. In order for flow to happen, challenging uh, activity requiring skill, merging of actions and awareness, clear goals, direct and immediate feedback, concentration, sense of control, a loss of self consciousness, and an altered sense of time. Tick, 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 tick. But there is an interesting thing here that I think you can't rely on the theory of flow to talk about emotional responses to games. So we had a couple of people talk about this earlier. Um, Eve, in particular, has a problem with flow because she doesn't know what she's doing. Josh. Jack. Jack, sorry. Josh, Jack, Josh. 
Why do people have to have four letter names? Jack, URC. Do you play it online or just yourself? A um, bit of both. Bit of both. Yeah. And you don't feel that confident in your ability? Mm, kind of, yeah. Kind of. So when you get wailed on, <laughs> that it's, sort of, it, 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 it's wrong to call it, and I'm sort of, you know, projecting from my own experiences of things here, right? yeah. but it's it's not a sense of anger necessarily, it's more of a sense of frustration, right? Yeah. Yeah. What this theory doesn't account for is the emotional response that comes from frustration, which can be very, very powerful in games, where, if you like, the challenging activity requiring skill, the skills that we have, although we may be skilled, are not necessarily commensurate with the level that is being asked for us at that point in time. That frustration is an emotional response, but it isn't a flow response. Because if, if we were in a state of flow, we wouldn't necessarily feel that negative emotional state. So, while this flow is important in terms of the emotional tenor of games, I don't think there's any doubt about that, it is only important for some emotional responses. And I think there are other emotional responses for games. Like Jack's good example, there are a lot of other kind of examples of this in everyday life which you can extrapolate to the game situation. You've all, over the last couple of years, done an assignment of some nature. Where you thought, fuck, <laughs> this is, I don't know what I'm doing. This is really hard. This is so difficult. It's not fun, right? When you're in that state, it is not fun. That flow state is completely missing. But you've all, I hope, done an assignment, at least one, where you thought, oh yeah, this is nice. I don't mind doing this. This is really easy. Well, not, maybe not really easy, because then it's kind of boring, but it's at the right level of challenge, right level for your skills, right level for your knowledge. It just comes together and it's kind of, yeah, I like this. You know, this, I, why can't every assignment be like this? Yeah, you all have that, right? It's the different emotional tenor that we get to video games is very much contingent on that kind of sweet spot being hit. It's interesting that even with, you know, um, something like your experiences with URC, Jack, at some point you'll feel that kind of emotional connection to the game because you fit into this paradigm of experience. And then at other times it, it kind of just yanks us out of it, you know. Game designers play with that. Now those can be deliberate sort of um, choices by game designers to make points during their games about the emotions that you should be feeling at this point in time, you know, to make you think about what is going on. I'm not convinced EA are masterful at doing that. I think they just don't really help us with the learning curve very often when we play online. That's more of a bad design choice that that happens. Um, but, it, it, you know, that sort of provoking frustration and provoking, you know, difficulty in being able to enact the goals that you want to do is something that game designers will use in order to make points. I know before um, the break, I talked about, not the break today, the two weeks thing, talked about Death Stranding. Um, that's a deliberate choice by the maker of that game, Hideo Kojima, to make that game as boring as possible. He did it on purpose because he wants you to think about why you're actually bothering to play the game in the first place. And the best way of doing that is by making it frustrating and dull, so you never get into the flow state itself, that you feel emotionally satisfied with the choice you've made. As I said before, it's kind of bonkers <laughs> that somebody would give him $50 million to do this. It's kind of insane, but there you go. Games about games are always weird. So, um, there are researchers who've really gone into flow in this way as well and looked at how flow develops as an emotional um, uh, tool. So Chen believes that flow theory provides a working model for game designers, encouraging them to keep players in a sweet spot where they have the right amount of ability to meet challenges at hand. If you get out of that, you lose control of the emotional tenor of games. 
Make the game too hard, people get frustrated. Make the game too easy, people get bored. Which is another emotional response that we always discount. Boredom is an emotion. But it's an emotion which is also just as destructive as frustration. Because when you're bored with something, what do you do? Yeah, you turn it off. I hope. If you're really bored with something, I, this is really bad advice in the context of a lecture. But if you're really bored with something, you turn it off and do something else, right? Um, that's the worst advice I've ever given in a lecture, I think. But there you go. Um, I would have, don't do it for mine, but you know, take that on board. For other lectures that you've got, if you're really bored, fuck off and do something else. You know, it's, it's being recorded. It's okay. Um, when players discuss the emotions they feel, much of their vocabulary relates to flow. Curiosity, excitement, challenge, elation, triumph, or lack, frustration, confusion, and discouragement. So you can see the importance of the, emo of the state of flow in terms of the emotional responses people have. So flow theory does offer us a lens for understanding the emotional power of games. And to talk about the assignment coming up so quickly now. Um, if you're gonna talk about flow and emotion, it could be useful to talk about how the things switch between these two and how you ground, how you talk about games in terms of being in a flow state. Don't worry, I have a face. That's just my face. <laughs> it isn't. You're looking at it like, oh, what am I going to do? No, no, There's I'm a whole bunch really here okay. that you can draw on, I would argue, in terms of the emotional response to a game, because if, you know, if you set the scene here of like, you've never played this game until doing this assignment, and I find it frustrating, boring, and confusing, it's like, yeah, that's the emotional tenor of the game for you. Just because other people in this room might enjoy it, but that's, who gives a shit what other people enjoy, you know? Some people enjoy having needles inserted into their genitals. It ain't for me. You know, so, you know, it's, it, you know, don't worry about what other people might get out of the game. It's what you get out of the game that's important. Or don't, as the case may be. Yeah. We can borrow from psychology heavily here. So grounded cognition theory um, does help explain what it is about games that changes the range of emotional experiences possible. Grounded cognition theory is one of these areas in psychology that has no grounding. So the irony of it is not lost on me. There isn't a particular psychologist or group of psychologists like a point to here and say they are responsible for grounded cognition. It doesn't exist. Um, if you want to cite something about grounded cognition, what I would do is use Catherine Isbister's book. And you know, she talks about it in that context. She's kind of a psychologist as well, so we can contextualize it and this is something we have spoken about already. Um, Will Wright talking the first time he played black and white creature Isle. Anyone familiar with this? Morgan, give us a pressy. Um, <clears throat> I, play, I, I played it ages ago, but it's like a game where you have to look after an animal and the way you treat the animal affects how the animal will behave around the world. Yeah. It's, um, you can see some of the roots of Animal Crossing in this. Um, there's been some interesting spin-offs on this kind of game, like that goose game. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, where you don't really control... The whole point of that is you're not in control of the goose, right? Which is pretty awesome. Um, yeah, you pick a creature, you train it, and the way that you train it... It's, 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 it's a really interesting sort of game for people to play because it's parenting, basically. This is a facsimile of, you know, you have this thing, you train it, and then it goes off into the world and does stuff. Um, the player can create an evil creature by treating it badly, or a moral. It's not. It's not a good. It's not a subtle analogy to parenting. It's a very direct one, as far as I can see. <coughs> Will Wright started uh, slapping his creature around, and then felt an intense sense of guilt about doing it. Now. Stray. I can imagine there's a few points in that game where I could see the cat getting mashed. I won't do it. Why is the question here? And grounded cognition theory gives us, 
I think an explanation of why. Now, this attachment, first of all, it, it's like, you know, we don't get this if we're reading a book or watching a film, because we don't have that level of control where we can actually enact these things. We might feel uneasily like we're colluding with the filmmaker in particular ways. A couple of weeks ago, I watched um, a Sam Peckinpah movie from the 60s called The Wild Bunch. Um, I haven't watched it in a long time, and there's something weird about the subject position of that film, where basically the, the Wild Bunch are a bunch of cowboys posing as fascists, well, fascists posing as cowboys, and you're colluding with them. You know, you've got an emotional sense of collusion with the vile things that these characters do. Um, because we have a choice in how we do this, it goes beyond uneasy collusion, you know, right felt actual guilt. Now, the techniques invoke emotion because they mirror the way our brains make sense of the world around us in everyday life. Grounded cognition basically says the way that we do things in everyday life mirrors how we do things in other domains. So the reason why Will Wright felt guilty about slapping his character around and treating it badly was because in everyday life he would have felt bad about doing this. You know, the guilt comes from his own experiences. This is why I would feel bad about killing the cat, because I really like cats. And I've had cats most of my life, and it sits really uneasily with me to kill a cat, even though it's a video game. And and guess what? The little cat would come back to life if I did it. But I feel really bad about it. Um, we compare what we sense and experience in any given moment, included in a game, to our past experiences in order to come up with a set of emotional and cognitive responses that are actually grounded in everyday experience. Hence the word grounded. Grounded in our everyday experiences. So if you are a psycho, you're going to have no problem killing straight, you know, or, you know, if you are, you know, emotionally deficient, you're going to have no problem with the girl jumping off the roof in Life is Strange. Splat. I hope she makes a nice noise when she hits the ground. <laughs> you know, and, and so on. Or, you know, you're going to have no problem getting that gold trophy on Red Dead Redemption. Oh, tired. So, um, the, the one thing that really, I don't, I don't know if this is me, but the one thing I find really problematic about that is not hog tying an innocent person. It's that you have to do it to a woman. <laughs> That's the bad bit. I don't know why. It's, that shouldn't, it's a game. It shouldn't matter that bit, but that really matters as far as I'm concerned. Um, Okay, do this really quick, because I do want some answers to this, but I know, like always, I've completely lost sense of time here. So, are there any uh, motions do you think can't be done in games? This gives us an idea of the kind of range Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I would tend to agree with that. I think there might be a facsimile of it, but it's it's with far less intensity. Yeah, yeah. it's like grief diluted, grief yeah. light. I like that second sentence, Ben, because that's applicable to a lot of different fields in life. <laughs> I think I agree, John. Because that was the point of this question. <laughs> Is it an emotion? 
I don't, that would be my only question there, but I see where you're coming from. It's, it's really, it's very hard these days to be patient with video games, I think. I mean, there's an expectation of instant gratification with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, that's not historically how games were built at all. The, you know, you were meant to be frustrated until you got good. You know, there was a curve which you had to go on. And I, I think a lot of the changes in games we've seen in the last 15 years are to get rid of that curve. You know, and, and you know, say that you don't need to be patient anymore. You can get super good, super easy, super quick with these really easy challenges we'll put at the beginning of something, and then you know we'll ramp it up from there. But that ramp up in many things now just isn't. It, it, it's just repetition rather than actual challenge. You know? So I am really bored of Far Cry Six now because you just do the same thing over and over again. It's the same mission all the time. This is this is dull. You know, I've liberated this outpost twenty times because it's exactly the same fucking challenge every time. But PS5 makes it look pretty. At least, so. um, I I would agree with Jess's point about grief. Um, for those of us who have experienced grief in life, and I'm sure we all have, there is a depth to grief, which I, I think is probably the only thing that can't be replicated in a video game experience. Um, some people would disagree with me, and that's okay. Um, I think Jordan's answer to this is ideal. I think it's dependent on the individual. Our emotional tenor of ourselves as people will be reflected in the emotional responses we have to the video games we play. Some of us have different we all are different emotionally. That is a product of who we are, our upbringings, our you know, socialization, our interests, etc., etc. We are all different people. Nobody has the same emotional response to other people. I get emotional about things which are absolutely fucking ridiculous. I buy, I don't know why, but I buy coffee from Costco, right? And this morning, I'm there, get my coffee, and I couldn't put the lid on properly, and I called the lid a motherfucker. <laughs> there were people around, all right? <laughs> I mean, th this wasn't in isolation, and like, one of the young lads who was stocking the shelves just looked at me like, shit, that guy's a psycho. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, dude, you don't know the half of it. Um, Something in the office this morning really triggered me. I can't remember what it was now. It was an email off someone asking me to do something. And I was like, you fuck. My emotional responses to things are not always appropriate, is all I'm saying. But they're mine. Other people would not behave in this way. But somebody else would do something, and I'd be like, like you know, there's something wrong with them, you know? Um, so, yeah, I, I watch people do road rage. You're like, it's fucking calm down. You know, you, you, you've got a ton of metal. Please, take it easy, you know? Um, it's, it's okay to be an individual when it comes to these things. And some people will have normal emotional responses, and some people, you know, whatever that means, and some people will have, you know, quite abnormal things. Some people get really attached to very bizarre stuff. Some people are just psychos. It's all about the individual. Can't discount how important, in terms of game design, the avatar is. So, um, storytellers have created specific characters with whom viewers or readers always identify. This is the whole point of storytelling in many ways. And game designers have always adopted this technique for grounding us, so I'm using the term again, uh, with a player's identification with the in-game events. In gaming, the protagonist is known as the avatar. So. In order for emotional response to be magnified, avatar design and our control and identification with the avatar needs to be maximized in some way. We need to feel a relationship with the character that we're playing. And games that I've often struggled to engage with, it can be put down to the fact that I really don't care about this thing that I am. You know. Um, so, before I went to Poland, I got a 
tattoo on my leg of Sonic and Tails. Because I really like Sonic and Tails. And um, from moment one in, 19, in on November the 4th, 1992, when Sonic 2 was released, I even remember the fucking date, um, I was like, yeah, these, these two are my friends. Yeah? And I feel an emotional response to those two characters. There's something wrong with me. But as avatars, they worked really effectively at that point in time. So, we learn about how avatar, we learn about the avatar, about how they look and how they react to other characters. Um, this is often the role of non-playable characters in games, is to help us establish a sense of what our character is. It's like even though Link doesn't actually speak throughout the franchise, I still have like a massive connection with him because he's like yeah. they're growing up and like we know his character. We Absolutely. Know he feels like Zelda. He's going to rescue us the hundred time. Yeah. But he doesn't need to say anything for me to feel that kind of connection with him. No, and historically, game characters have had that. Of course, speech in video games really doesn't become a big thing until around about the turn of the century. You know, um, and if you look, if you go back, go back to. Um, the original Resident Evil 2, which came out in 97, you, you wouldn't relate to those characters based on what they were saying. Because <laughs> like it was garbage. And the, the, uh, Nintendo, interestingly, have kind of eschewed character speech. It's almost like, you know, we're the silent era of video games. And they never bother updating it, because they didn't need to. It's like Mario, when he does speak, it's kind of shit. It's kind of crazy. Like, it's, it's like, could you be more offensively stereotypically Italian? Um, <clears throat> you're better off not bothering, you know. And I think that's always what they've done with Link: mm -hmm. is there is a, such a strong emotional connection to that character because of the ways we spoke about today, about the choices you can make with Link, and because of the sort of grounded cognition that they play on in those games that you can relate the choices that you have to your everyday life and you know what the consequences of those things are, and to a certain extent. Link is defined by the interactions that he has with other characters as well. Not just Zelda, but every other character that he encounters. This is a really important thing about avatars and how they develop, is we understand avatars not just by embodying them and acting with them, but how those avatars interact with other things in the game world as well. And I was saying, Link is a very compelling character. Equally, and in fact far more, we can, you know, that's a super successful character in terms of the emotional grounding that it has. There are millions of video game characters which you simply do not give a shit about. Um, I'm just uh, one of the most boring games I've ever played was one of the um, Deus Ex um, series. Now, I loved that those games a long time ago, but the ones they brought out, I think the last one I played was like Human Reimagined or something ridiculous like that. It was called. It's just, I did not give a shit about the character. It was, this is so dull. It's just this chiseled, cybernetic guy who kind of, mur, 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 to every other character in the game, who comes back and goes, mur, mur, mur. He's like, this is so boring. I, 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 an hour. Um, fortunately, I only paid two ninety nine for it. That was less than a bus to town. You know, so you know, I, I can't argue with that, you know. So, the Avatar's personal qualities are reflected in what is possible for the player to do. The player moves through the game world taking action to this person. And then our control translates into four levels of um, characterization. Visceral, cognitive, social and fantasy. It's these levels that we relate to the Avatar with and this is what dictates our emotional connection to the Avatar that we play. So the body itself and its capabilities and tendencies becomes a vehicle for action, and this is the visceral level. Um, I choose Lara Croft for this for a very good reason. There was something both revolutionary and deeply depressing about Tomb Raider when it first came out. One, that there was a female character. It had, I mean, there had been a few games before, but very few where you could actually play a female character. A female character that wasn't defined necessarily by weakness, but by strength and intelligence, because most of the original Tomb Raider was actually about solving puzzles rather than being physically energetic in any way. So all of that was good. And then on the other hand, you had, I mean, she would have just fallen over in everyday life. 
I mean, the characters, I mean, no. Either Fallen Over, incredible back pain. Um, and every time she jumped on something, she grunted. Yeah. And that was grim. It was like, and it was like, that was, people don't make that sound when you grunt. People make it in a really fucking specific uh, instance. Um, well, anyway, people don't make that sound either. They make it when they're making porno movies. Mm -hmm. This is, yeah, it's, uh, so, the Lara Croft character was set up in a particular way at a visceral level. It's interesting to me that most fandom in the mid-90s was tied to video games were more male-dominated in terms of players at that time anyway. But, it, it, I mean, the bizarre thing was people were buying like, posters of Lara Croft to put in their bedrooms. And it's like, don't jerk off to this. This is not good, all right? Oh, yeah, 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 when she was actually, with, well, and you got it with, they because they've had a couple of goes at making the movies, right, and, okay, Angelina Jolie was like the most uninspiring choice for that ever, but then they did um, Alice Vikander, played her in a reboot of the movie, and I thought, that's really interesting, because Alice Vikander doesn't look anything like Lara Croft at all, so you're trying to do something with the character, and people didn't watch the fucking film. Uh, so this is, I, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't watch it either because it sounded really shit. But, um, but I thought it was interesting to trying to change that. <coughs> so, in terms of the cognitive level, what we're talking about is strategies, actions, reactions, which are rewarded or rewarded for others, um, to the game mechanics. So at another level, the cognitive level, it's you know what we do with the character, which is really important. Um, one of my favourite series of games is Borderlands, and I find it really interesting to play those games at least three times with different classes of character and development because there is genuinely a different game experience each time. It's a very cleverly made series of games where you do get a lot of replay value because the characters you play give you a completely set, different set of choices about how you navigate the game space itself and what tactically you can do. If you want to blast through the game, you can do that. If you want to stealth through the game, you can. You don't have any choice, actually, in some instances. You've got to do it that way. So, and it completely changes the emotional tenor of the game as well. It goes from being, oh, to actually being, wow, I've got to be really careful here. And you get a different emotional attachment to the avatar that you play as as well. In ha um, inhabiting the person's avatar, social persona allows the player to try out social qualities that they may not normally possess, so there is a, a social level of avatar involvement here, social level of experience. And all of these design choices work together to allow the player to explore alternative fantasy levels, or fantasy selves, through the actual in-game performance, the fantasy level. Has anyone ever come to this conclusion that when you play in, this is you? Nobody's admitting to it. I know Cheska. <laughs> to see it written on your face. <laughs> Anyone? I, I mean, I'm happy to say so. Yeah, I, 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 I can get deep into something. I was like, yeah. In fact, weirdly, the first time I played Resident Evil 2, I mean, like playing that for hours and hours and hours, and thinking, I, yeah, I, looking back on it, now, I was like, Claire, that was me. <laughs> you know, it's kind of that cin cinematic experience when I look back on something and I think, that was me doing that, and I said, no, that was Claire Redfield, that wasn't you. <laughs> um, so, over the course of a game, we extend ourselves further um, into the motivations and the visceral, cognitive, social and fantasy possibilities, forging an identification grounded um, in observation as well as experience. It's weird because I was playing The Witcher the other day and like I was like thinking about Geralt and like I was like, oh we just did a big quest, let's chill out. And I found myself walking Geralt to the brothel and I was just thinking like, why am I doing that? Like as me. Why were you but doing that, Jessica? Geralt because Geralt wanted to go. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know? Yeah, of course you did. It's it, 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 uh, interesting, yeah, yeah. Why, why, as video game characters, do we go to brothels? I don't know. We're not getting the same kind of gratification that we did in everyday life. Um, does that reflect on our everyday life choices? Do we, as people, go to brothels? I, I don't know, whatever you guys want to do in your spare time is up to you. 
But, um, you know, we are... <laughs> it's an interesting set of... It, it's that reflective aspect which tells me that you've got a connection <laughs> on a several different levels to that character. I fancied it, you know? Yeah, you could just fancied an afternoon off. Yeah. Um, so, what we have, what is the process here? The player joins to this kind of virtual self through action-based, um, avatar-based action, the marks of core innovation that games have brought to media. This is the thing that game, that other media cannot do. You know, we cannot, when we're watching a film, you might identify very strongly with the lead character, but you have the visceral connection. I don't think there's a mechanism for doing that. Can you explore the character socially with other players or with NPCs? I don't think you can do that. You know, can you um, enact a cognitive sense of connection with them where your thoughts lead to action on screen? That's not how film works. So there are a whole different set of connections here with the avatar. This is where the use of avatar theory is quite problematic in game studies because avatar theory is borrowed from literature studies where you look at the main character of something and assess how effective that main character is. Unfortunately, that just doesn't work in game studies in the same way because we do different things. So we've had to develop the avatar in particular ways. This then relates to how we actually play. So solo play, um, it's not lonely to play on your own. Um, you know, it, if you are lonely, I would recommend playing video games because it gives you a sense of connection to something which is larger than yourself. So yeah, definitely video games provide support and game designers use dynamic and reactive engagement with other characters, actually give us an emotional palette by which we can you know, navigate our everyday lives and bring some you know, emotional relief to our lives. In a game, a non-playing character can make a joke that lightens the mood, provide assistance in the nick of time, can sacrifice himself so the player can carry on. So this dynamic engagement or parasocial engagement, anything time time we're engaging with a piece of media that is not actually another person, but is media itself, it's what we call parasocial. Um, has anyone got an example of a non-playable character that really brought out an emotional response in them? Laughter. Um, has anyone ever played the uh, Elder Scrolls Four Oblivion? Yes. The NPCs in that are terrible. <laughs> the conversations they have, that is not human interaction. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> That's interesting, actually, how bad NPCs can be at doing... They have one... these really, like, short conversations, like, Hi, hi, have you heard of the High Elves? Yes. <laughs> goodbye, <laughs> goodbye. That's... So conversations work. I don't know, mate. It's funny. I I, I'm not. I, I'm not convinced. You know, I, I I see some of the first years talking to one another, and it's all that. Um, you know, they can watch this, by the way. It's all up on YouTube. Um, NPCs of that nature can be pretty funny and um, emotive. I don't, I'm trying to think of an example of an NPC that I like got gutted about if they died. There must be one. I've played so many video games over the years that as a, I can't remember one off the hand now. But. Uncharted is quite good. Like You get quite connected with Sully. He's mm. almost like your father figure. And he's quite funny. And there's a moment when you think he's died and I was quite gutted. But also the NPCs in that game are kind oh. of annoying. Because they help you, but they often get in the way. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Kill. So it's a strange I relationship. I mean, this parasocial interaction with characters, uh, parasociality has been around a very, very long time. And in media studies now, we're increasingly using the term parasocial to mean relationships with people on social media, um, you know, where you never actually have a human relationship with somebody on social media, but you have a parasocial relationship. We usually use it in the context of influencers or somebody like that. I don't think actually that definition of parasocial works because I don't think, actually think that's what it means. I think parasocial is far more about creating relationships with character rather than, I mean, they might be influencers, but they are real people at the end of the day as well. Um, a parasocial relationship with an AI on social media might be something, and there are influencers out there that aren't real in that sense. 
So media creators encourage those strong feelings through just strategic elements, they always have done. Um, and games do this in droves. So parasocial interaction, again, I'm just seeding basically stuff you could talk about in your, your assignments here, right? I'm just going to skip over that. Social play, different set of emotional tenor altogether. And I think this is a good place to finish. Um, the isolated gamer is the stereotype of games. However, that stereotype really isn't in line with how games are actually played today. The vast majority of players in this day and age are social players who play alongside other people. Um, there's a long history of doing this. The mid-90s is when it becomes technically possible for most people to do this, although historically this has gone back further. But the social aspects of games um, are very, very important. Um, these guys are my heroes because they use one of my favourite games of all time to do this. But looking at social tenor games, they got um, Mandrick and his pen invited players of digital games to bring a friend to their lab where they both played EA Hockey 94. Best game ever. Uh, each person played in two different situations, against the computer and against his or her friend. And then they used, again, a series of physiological responses to assess the emotional content of what they were doing. People far preferred social play both in qualitative aspects of what they reported, but much more importantly, quantitatively as well. The, you know, the emotional responses that you can measure from things like um, galvanic skin response, which is basically how much physical arousal you get because it measures sweat on your skin, way up. So we actually find more excitement, more arousal by playing games in this way. So there's something very satisfying about bonding and overcoming a challenge with another person. This is why they get you to do group work. This is the whole point of doing group do you, Have you noted that you haven't done one piece of group work with me? Yeah. I don't want you to feel emotionally satisfied. I want you to feel dark. <laughs> you, know, you know, alone. Because you're going to die alone. Alright? Get fucking used to it. That's, Social psychologists demonstrate <laughs> that um, this leads to great feelings of connectedness, mutual liking and rapport. And those are all positive things, apparently. Um, and games can obviously facilitate this. So the emotional tenor of playing with other people is really, really important. I do, again, encourage you all to go and watch the Channel 4 series, Dead Pixels, which gives a fairly unique stance on what is being discussed in these slides. And it's very, very funny with it. And the last emotional thing I want to discuss in this is the interface and the idea of tacticity. Games are not distant to us. We interface with games physically. Games are felt. And you may think, okay, yeah, well that's down to like rumble packs and you know the you know controller you use. Even down to the fact that you have to physically interact with something to do it means that we are always touching. We are always feeling, we're always getting our hands into a particular position. We are developing knowledge within our hands. How we play games is knowledge based on how we know our body and how our body reacts to particular situations. This all intensifies the connection that we have with the media itself and therefore adds to the emotional tenor of what we have. And that sense of frustration very often when not in the sense that you have, Jack. When you pull it back to the when you start first playing you um, you will see right, it can be quite difficult because we haven't just, we haven't developed that interface with it yet. Once that interface comes in, we get comfortable. It's like, oh yeah, I love this game now until we get our ass whooped and then yeah, hate that game. So um, <laughs> always consider that the game involves a multi-sensory um, dimension. So Brendan Keogh talks about this extensively. And what uh, Larissa and Ingrid talk about in their book is haptic intimacy. That because our relationship with games is a touch-based relationship, we have a closeness to it, emotionally and physically. The body experience makes the game familiar, and this doesn't just go for what they call mimetic games, which is, is a class of game where your bodily motion powers the game itself. Examples of it being Guitar Hero, for example, where your bodily actions are mimicked in the game. 
any number of mobile games will do this as well. And of course, classically, anything to do with um, Nintendo's generation of consoles, the Wii and the Wii U, which you know built on that memetic interface in a big way. Jason Farman calls this um, pure perception. Uh, knowledge of others and self lies within our own body itself. So how we do things, where our knowledge of gaming exists is in our bodies. There's where the emotional content of a game is very different to a film or a book or a radio or whatever. And scholarship on this goes back a very long way. This book by David Sudno is an absolute classic, and I've got it in the reading for this week. Uh, it is an augmented eye that plays video games. Now, Sudno was, taught, was writing this in the days of Atari, uh, and that's basically the games he was writing about as well. But he was arguing that even back then, it was all about bodily interaction. That the reason why you play and play in a particular way is because your body is aligned with the game in particular ways. Video games are stories for the eye, the ear, and the muscles. We're embodied when we do them, and we configure our bodies in particular ways to play these. Um, and you might think, configure the body, how does that work? Well, ergonomically, game systems are designed these days in order to make it as comfortable as possible. In 1977, this wasn't the case, and you had this people would report to the doctor's surgery in Japan because their index fingers had become bent. Does anyone know why? Is it from a joystick from Pac-Man? Not, a couple of years before Pac-Man. And it was the non-joystick hand, interestingly. Space Invaders, stick, joystick. The positioning of the trigger button was such that you had to rest your wrist like this on the, con on the game console, which meant that your finger was always bent when you're pressing. You couldn't press flat like this. So you're always like, people's fingers got arthritis from playing the game so much. Um, <laughs> it's still bent. Arthritic response to um, playing an arcade video game. This wasn't an isolated thing. Uh, how they fixed it, I don't know. It just... um, <laughs> the major point here, our lived bodily experience of gaming. We have a kinesthetic relationship with games. Games aren't distant to us, they're embodied in particular ways, and this adds to how emotional tenor is felt. So, games are unique, choice and flow are important, we are active in games, that's why we have emotional responses. We understand gaming through our life experiences. We emotionally relate to avatars and NPCs. Avatars provide a means of self-presentation and understanding. An embodied relationship to games strengthens emotions. I nearly made it in time. Nearly, but fortunately nobody uses this room. So. More on strikes next week. I hope. Hopefully, we're not bloody happy. Don't forget office hours if you do want help with anything. Jack, the in particular, editing that together won't take very long. Especially if you want footage. Yeah, it's really, what, you, what I can show you how to do is how to cut um, sound up into chunks. It's like you don't even have to tell a story so much. You're going to have like four or five different uh, parts and you just move them around. Yeah, cool.